Today we are going to discuss tournament bankroll management. Understand that bankroll management is absolutely vital to you succeeding at poker long term. To win at poker, you only have to do three things. It's not that many. First, you have to find a game you can beat. You can do this by playing against really bad players or by getting really good at poker. Next, number two, you have to play that game a lot. If your butt is not in the chair and you are not playing, you are not making money. And number three, you have to keep a proper bankroll. It really is that simple. And in this video, we are going to discuss proper bankroll management. Understand that there are a lot of poker players who crush their opponents. They're good at finding a game they can beat. They're good at playing it a lot, but they refuse to keep a proper bankroll and that results in them losing long-term despite the fact that they actually are far better at poker than their opponents. And I do not want that to happen to you. So you have to be a little bit disciplined and you have to keep a proper bankroll. Here we have tournament bankroll requirements. This chart presumes you have a 30% return on investment. We're gonna discuss how to calculate that in just a minute. This means that every time you buy into a tournament, you win 30% on top. If you buy in for $100, you expect on average to get out $130. Now, a lot of players will drastically overestimate their return on investment. They think that they're winning at 100% return on investment or 200%. Hate to break it to you, you're probably not. And if you are over some sample size, it's not all that big. Say you play 50 tournaments and you smash them. Well, sometimes you're gonna run hot over a small sample size. Understand that most poker players have a 30% return on investment or less which means they actually need more buy-ins than what we're about to go through. As your edge decreases, either because you're not as good as you think you are or because perhaps your opponents are better than you think they are, you need more buy-ins. If you actually are way better than your opponents, for whatever reason, you're going to need fewer buy-ins. Also, as we see in this chart, you need more buy-ins as more players enter the tournament, which a lot of people do not consider. But if you think about it, it makes a whole lot of sense. Imagine a large field, 2,600 player tournament. How often are you really going to take the top three or four places in that tournament? Well, three or four times out of 2,600 if you break even. So if you're good, maybe two or three times out of 1,800 or out of 1,400. That means you have to play, what, 500 times to get one decently good finish at the final table? not very good. It's not very good odds. So that means that you're going to go a long time between big scores. Your bankroll is going to slowly trickle down, trickle down, 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 down. And every once in a while, you get a huge spike up. It's going to trickle down, 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 down. Then you get a huge spike up. Compare that to a nine player tournament. Well, you're going to win at one and nine if you break even, right? So in that game, you need way fewer buy-ins because you're not going to have nearly as many Long, 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 long downswings, assuming you have a 30% return on investment. Now, basically no one's going to have a 30% return on investment in any reasonably structured nine-person tournament because you can only win money from eight other players, and they're not all going to be horribly awful. Also, in nine-player tournaments, you are not going to have all that much time to extract value from your opponents. So, in nine-player tournaments, usually the most you can have is something like a 15% return on investment or so, and that would even be pretty high. Back when I used to play a lot of online sit and goes, I had a 5% return on investment and that was considered good. So you're not gonna have very big of an edge in fast structured tournaments with relatively few players. So if you are focusing on growing a bankroll because you don't have a whole lot of money yet, you really need to focus on playing games with relatively few players. Notice here we have a 45 player tournament. If you have 30% return on investment, which you certainly can in small stakes games against very bad players, You need 69 buy-ins. Nice. That means if you're playing $100 buy-in tournaments, you need $6,900 in your bankroll. That may sound like a ton to you, but it is what is required. If you play with a shorter bankroll than that, unless you're reloading it on a regular basis, which means it's actually bigger than it may seem at this exact moment, you're, you're just gambling. Your risk of ruin is going to be through the roof. If you're playing gigantic field tournaments, like a lot of people do every summer, 
They take all their money. They go to Vegas. They play 2,600 player tournaments with like 50 buy-ins to their name. That is obviously a blunder because you actually need 375 buy-ins. Yeah, it's rough. Imagine you're playing $1,000 buy-in tournaments. You need $375,000 sitting on the side. No one does that. And that is why most people go broke. Who'd have thought? Now, it is worth noting, as there are more players in the tournament, your return on investment will be higher if you are a winning player. And that's because as you have more players you can win money from, and as you have more time to win money from your opponents, your edge will be higher, which is why you cannot have a big return on investment in nine player tournaments, but you can have a big return on investment, perhaps 100%, in 2,600 player tournaments. That said, start by presuming you have about a 30% return on investment because you're probably not gonna be that much higher unless you are a world-class poker player. So what is your return on investment? Your return on investment is how much you make on average each time you enter. Your ROI is figured out by your total profit, which is your the amount you cash out for minus the amount you bought in for, divided by your total buy-ins. So let's say, for example, we play 100 tournaments with an average buy-in of $115. That means we are in for $11,500. That's how much we bought in for. And we cash for $15,000, okay? $15,000 minus $11,500 is $3,500. That's our actual profit out the door. We take $3,500 divided by the amount we bought in for, which is $11,500, which equals 30%. Over this 100 tournament sample, we had a 30% return on investment. Now, return on investment is actually very difficult to nail down and very difficult to clearly say what it is because it's going to fluctuate from event to event. If your opponents in your particular tournament are especially terrible, for whatever reason, your return on investment will be higher. If people can re-enter, usually your return on investment will be lower. We'll discuss that a little bit later. In tough tournaments against the best players in the world, your ROI may be tiny. In main events, with tons of players, your ROI will be bigger. So understand it will fluctuate from tournament to tournament. So you have to be smart and play tournaments where you expect to have a large edge. As a great example of this, one time I went to a poker tournament. I flew across the country to go play it. It was a $10,000 buy-in main event. It was going to be super soft. I'm thrilled to play it. The day before the tournament, they had a $5,000 buy-in side event. I go downstairs to go play the tournament, and it had about 60 players. I looked at the players in the tournament, and it was about 58 of the best players in the world and two bad players. What kind of an edge do you think you're going to have in a $5,000 buy-in tournament against 58 of the best players in the world and two bad players? Well, the answer is none. Whatever the casino rakes is going to take all the money. So, don't play it. If you don't expect to win money in an event, you don't have to play. I went and played cash games instead and won a bunch of money. And then I played the main event with twice the buy-in the next day that had a thousand players with a nice edge, right? So you wanna make sure you're playing in tournaments that have an edge. It's not just based on the buy-in. It's not just based on your edge against players in general, right? Understand that if you play a spread of tournaments such that maybe you play $1,000 tournaments all the way up to $10,000 tournaments, you're probably going to have a much bigger edge in the smaller games because typically in smaller games, players play worse than they do in bigger games. So be very careful with the idea that I have a 30, of thinking I have a 30% ROI. Therefore, I have 30% ROI in all tournaments because you don't. As you play bigger, your ROI will go down. Okay? Let's talk about playing in tournaments with various sizes. Let's drill down a little bit here. You also need to be concerned with your average buy-in which is the total of all your buy-ins divided by the number of buy-ins. So let's say you decide to play $120 tournaments, $2,000, which is our total buy-ins, divided by $20, I'm sorry, divided by 100 equals $20. My brain's broken. Very easy, right? If you only play $20 tournaments, your average is $20. However, you could play $99 events and one $1,000 event. Let's got the calculator to make sure that makes sense. Got to prove it. Got to prove it. Show the receipts, right? We have $1,000. We have our one $1,000 tournament plus 990 equals divided by 100 
equals $19.90. So we have the same average buy and actually a little bit lower. But in this instance, we've played $10 tournaments and then one random $1,000 tournament for fun for the same average buy-in. Some people look at this and think, oh, good, I can play whatever I want. But absolutely not. Because now you've essentially taken all of the games you're playing, the $99, $10 games, and made them close to irrelevant. And you're just gambling on one big tournament. Do not do that. Now look, I definitely recommend you keep the spread of buy-ins that you play as close to reasonably possible. Okay, if you play mostly $100 games, you don't want to be playing random $1,000 games. I do think something like a 3 to 1 spread or a 4 to 1 spread or a 5 to 1 spread is fine. Assuming the largest games you play are soft and they are somewhat infrequent. And you're also willing to play smaller, especially when you don't expect the games to be especially soft. So don't get carried away with trying to play bigger games just because the game exists or because it's the main event at your local casino or whatever. If you are bankrolled for $100 games, you can't go around playing $1,000 games if you want to have any chance of longevity. If you just if you play these bigger games on a regular basis, yeah, you might get lucky and spike and get rich, but you're probably going to lose on average and it's going to be detrimental to your long-term success. So while it is fine to play some bigger games, you want to play the bigger games when they are the softest. When are games going to be the softest? There are four main times. The first is when prestige is involved. A lot of players want to win bracelets and rings and trophies and all that. And that attracts players who have no business playing decently big buy-in tournaments to go play decently big buy-in tournaments. So main events where prestige is tacked on for whatever reason are usually softer than events where there is far less prestige involved. Going back to that example I gave earlier, the $5,000 buy-in 60-player tournament, no one has a clue who won it today. But the $10,000 buy-in tournament with 1,000 players, you can probably Google it right now and the winner will come right up. And that's because that $10,000 buy-in tournament had prestige attached. It was a big main event. Whereas the $5,000 game was just a random side event, right? So despite having twice the buy-in, the $10,000 game was substantially softer than the $5,000 game, which means if you're looking to take a shot, you should play the $10,000 game and not the $5,000 game, assuming you're somewhat reasonably bankrolled. Next, tournaments are softest when players are looking to gamble. This is usually going to be on nights and weekends. The daily noon tournament at your local casino probably isn't going to be all that soft, whereas the 7 p.m. weekend night tournament is going to be pretty good. Tournaments are also soft when players are playing far out of their bankroll because they're going to be playing scared or they're just not bankrolled for the game and they're inevitably going to be out of their comfort zone, out of their skill depth, right? And that's usually going to be when you're playing with a lot of satellite players, which goes back to the idea of main events, right? You may say, well, some satellite players are good. Maybe they are. I'm sure some of them are very good. But on average, players who spend most of their time playing satellites are very good at playing a tournament with a satellite structure. And regular tournaments do not have the same structure as a satellite. We're going to be discussing satellites in a bit. Typically, though, if you have the chance to play with players who play a different structured game for the most part, you'd rather do that than play against players who play the tournament structure on a regular basis because they're going to understand the game better, right? Would you rather play No Limit Hold'em against a Pot Limit Omaha player or a No Limit Hold'em player? The answer is a Pot Limit Omaha player because it's a different game. Satellites and multi-table tournaments look the same, but they're very different. Next, tournaments are also softest when players are playing games that they do not know. Similar topic, right? This is going to be mixed game tournaments. In mixed game tournaments, where let's say you're playing horse and there are five different games, if you know all five games well, and your opponents do not, which inevitably, if you know them all well, they can only be break even or losing, at least on that simple metric, then that's good for you, right? That said, mixed game tournaments have their own problems. We're not going to get into that today because we are primarily talking about how to win at poker tournaments. And I don't even know the percentage, but like 98% of tournaments or more are no limit hold'em tournaments. So we're focusing on no limit hold'em tournaments. You want to make sure if you spend a lot of time learning a game, you can actually put in volume and play the game. It's not going to do you a ton of good to spend a substantial amount of time getting really proficient at a bunch of random games if you only get to play them once every week or once a year or something like that. It's not a great use of time. 
again, I want to make this clear. I'm, I'm approaching this from the point of view of if you don't have unlimited time and you are trying to grow a bankroll and you don't really care about gambling and having fun, this is these are the things you need to do. I get it. Mixed games are fun. I get it. Satellites can help you get rich quick and let you win a vacation sometimes. But you want to make sure you are playing in a game where you can, that you can beat. You get to play it a lot and that you're properly bankrolled for it. All right, here's a typical winning tournament player's graph. This is actually quite a beautiful graph. It's nice and tame. This player won about $8,700 over the course of 400 tournaments, which was 30 days of online play, with an average buy-in of $38 and a 55% return on investment. Depending how many tournaments you play in a day, it could take you two years or more to play this many tournaments. Okay. Notice that this player broke even from here to here. Take a look at that. They're actually down a little bit. They're down a little bit from here to here. That's 200 tournaments. If you play a tournament once a week, well, that's 200 weeks of breaking even, despite the fact that this player has a very nice 55% return on investment. If you play a tournament roughly every other day, that's a year of breaking even, despite having a good return on investment. Can you continue to show up and focus and play well for a year or more without making any money? A lot of people cannot. That drives a lot of people crazy. If that will drive you crazy, tournaments may not be for you. Just because a game exists does not mean you have to play it. If you think you need to be up all the time, well, I hate to break it to you, you're usually going to lose in tournaments. Take a look at this player. They're only up every once in a while from their previous peak. Notice right here, it took this player 75 tournaments to get to a new peak from here to here. And they, they were down at some point. Now, from here to here, another 70 tournaments or so. They have a few little trickle-ups here. We have this long break-even stretch here, and then this player spiked some big tournaments. Sometimes it happens, but usually in tournaments, you'll find that your bankroll goes down, 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 and then you spike. Then it goes down, 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 and then you spike. And as you play tournaments with more and more players, the downward period is going to last longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. Get used to it. If you're a live poker player with a 55% return on investments, which is pretty good, you should expect to have break-even years. I've had break-even years. Every good poker player out there has had break-even years, and that is normal. I've also had some insane spikes like this, right? It happens. Sometimes, though, you don't actually get the insane spikes for quite a long time. There are plenty of players who are absolutely world-class in my mind who have never been able to break into the highest stakes games because they are disciplined with their bankroll and they have yet to have a big score. I know from talking with them, though, they are absolutely world-class. Just haven't had a big score. A lot of people think they haven't had a big score because they're bad. They just get it all in at the final table with aces and lose to jacks, and then they're out, and they take sixth place instead of first. Tough luck. That's the game you signed up for. Understand that the rake matters. Many small six players would actually win if there was no rake. For example... Say you play $165 tournaments where $50 goes to the prize pool and $15 goes to the rake. And you win $7,000. Pretty good. This is like what a lot of local recreational players do over the course of a year. They play a tournament every two or three days. They win a little bit of money at the end of the year. They think, all right, I got $7,000. Good. They don't realize, though, that after the rake, they're only up $500. Over the 100 games for an 8% return on investment, which is not especially great. With no rake, though, that player would have been up 40%. Well, they would have had 40% return on investment, right? Because they won $2,000. If there was no rake, it would be 2,000 divided by uh, 5,000, which is 40%. And you're going to find that in general, 13% rake or more will be somewhat difficult to beat. And you can find, well... As a bit of an oversimplification, say you expect to have 30% return on investment with no rake, you kind of subtract the rake from it and see what your new return on investment will be, which will be 17%. And 
like I said, a lot of people drastically overestimate their edge. So many players think that they are 30% ROI players or 50% ROI players, but they're actually 10% ROI players. And sometimes they're roughly break even if they're not even accounting for the rake and then they are small losers. I mean, take a look at this player's graph, right? If you just didn't have this first half of the graph and you didn't have this back into the graph and all you had was this section here, this player would look like a break even player over the course of, what, 200 tournaments. It looked break even. But they were playing with 55% return on investment the whole time. It's crazy. Tournament variance is nuts. Get used to it, embrace it, but realize that the rake will crush you if you are not careful. And unfortunately for you, a lot of small stakes casinos have an egregiously big rake. You may buy in for $50, and you may pay $15 on top in rake. That's humongous. I would venture to say you're going to have a tough time winning much at all in these games. And realize, just because a game exists does not mean you have to play it. If your casino rakes a bunch, don't play. Remember, we're not playing to pass the time. We are playing to try to win money. So go find a place where you actually can win money. Which may be easier said than done in a lot of places. I fully realize that. Let's talk about re-entry tournaments. This should be capitalized, shouldn't it? Re-entry tournaments are the same as regular tournaments, except, very importantly, edges will be lower because the best players will re-enter as is required because they lose their chips and they can re-enter. And every time they re-enter, they will have some positive return on investment. So if all the good players re-enter as much as they can, as much as demanded based on how well they do in the tournament, and every time they buy in, they'll have some positive ROI, where is that ROI coming from? Well, it's coming from everybody else in the tournament to some extent. And you're going to find that a long time ago, before there were re-entry tournaments, there used to be no re-entry tournaments. Did you know that? Back when I won that trophy and that trophy and a bunch of the other ones, there were no re-entries. And that resulted in return on investments being a whole lot higher because the good players could only play once and they could only extract their edge one time. They could not extract the edge over and over and over. So... If you have the option, try to play tournaments that do not allow re-entries because every single time a good player buys in again, they're taking a little bit of money out of the prize pool and putting it in their pocket on average. When you do opt to re-enter, when you're considering re-entering, you want to treat it as a completely different event with a worse structure. For example... Say you buy in at the beginning of the tournament, you play for a while, you bust right before the end of the re-entry period, and you have to decide if you should re-enter. Well now, instead of starting with, let's say, 200 big blinds, you start with 20 big blinds, which is quite common in a lot of tournaments. What kind of an edge do you really expect to have with 20 big blinds? The answer is not a lot, which means that you're going to need a substantially bigger bankroll to play that tournament, because now your edge is going to be much smaller, right? you have less time to extract money at this point and you're starting with only 20 big blinds. So what a lot of players do wrong is they, let's say they're bankrolled for $100 tournaments and they're playing a $100 re-entry tournament and they buy in at the beginning and then they bust right before the re-entry period and they re-enter again. They actually need a substantially larger buy-in for that next re-entry because the return on investment is going to be much smaller on that entry. Now it is true that as you can re-enter later and later into the tournament that you get closer to getting in the money and you get closer to getting a minimum cash but your edge is going to be so minimal, like 5% return on investment. And a lot of players are happy playing for 5% return on investment. But it's not where you're going to have a humongous edge, right? Also, when you do re-enter, do not treat it as I now have to cash for two buy-ins to break even. What happens on any, indiv any individual day is completely irrelevant. A lot of players think, oh, he bought in seven times. He needs to take fourth place to break even. Get that thought process out of your head. It is nonsense. It is absolute nonsense. Every single time you re-enter, it just counts as another entry on your ledger. Obviously, keep track of your results. I don't know if I've said that yet. You need to keep track of all the tournaments you play. Every single one of them, either with a phone app or with an Excel spreadsheet. I just keep a track of all my tournaments in an Excel spreadsheet. It's nice and easy. So yeah, re-entry tournaments are tough. Understand that quite often you may be very properly bankrolled for the initial tournament, but then for the later tournament, you may not be properly bankrolled. So 
When do we, we when do we re-enter? Are we still properly bankrolled? Next, are we going to play well? A lot of players get mad when they lose because they're babies. They think they're supposed to win. I just showed you a graph. It shows you're not supposed to win all that often. Get used to it. Are you going to play well? Imagine you buy in. You get it all in with aces on the first hand against kings and you lose. Should you re-enter? Well, if you're a good, strong poker player and you don't care about the inevitable swings of the game, the answer is obviously yes. What if you get it in with aces again on the next hand and you lose? Should you re-enter? Well, are we still properly bankrolled? Are we going to play well? If we are, then yes. What if you get busted with aces 15 times in the first level? Should you re-enter? Are you still properly bankrolled? Are you still going to play well? Then the answer is yes. Assuming the game's not rigged. So, these two are very important. Next, are the available seats generally soft? Especially in a lot of smaller field events at local casinos or sometimes even at high rollers, although they've got this figured out now to where you can't game the system. If you're playing in, let's say, a 27-person tournament, and let's say there are three empty seats, one at each table, if those seats are especially soft, you should expect to have a higher return on investment. What I, and what I mean by soft is there are a lot of bad players at those tables, or the seat at the table has the bad players on the direct right. And no limit hold'em, chips flow to the left. You want the bad players at your table and on the right. If the seats that are available are very good, you should be way more inclined to re-enter. If the seats that are available is very bad, you should be way less, way less inclined to re-enter. As a very easy example, say there's three tables, there's one open seat. And you know if you re-enter, you're going to get this. This is not how it works in the high stakes at all. They will redraw the tables in various ways to where you're going to get a random seat. But in a lot of local casinos, they don't do that. They just tell you to take the seat that's open. What if the table that has the seat open is especially difficult? Because everybody there is pretty good. You know all the regular regulars at your casino, and you know they're all good. You should expect to have basically no return on investment at that seat. So you should not re-enter. Even if it's the middle stage of the re-entry period, or even very early. What if the seat's especially soft, though? Then you should definitely re-enter, because now your required bankroll is much lower, because your return on investment is going to be much higher. Next question. Are more profitable games to play available? Say you are considering playing that, or re-entering at the last minute with 20 big blinds, and you're going to have 5% return on investment, let's say. Is that worth your time? Well, it's a $100 buy-in tournament. You're making $5 for spending the next, what, hour in the tournament? Plus, you're going to take on a lot of variants. Does it make sense to buy in and spend an hour to try to win $5? Probably not, right? Also, say your tournament started at noon, $100 tournament that starts at noon, and now it's 7 o'clock, and you bust, and you can re-enter, or you can enter another $100 tournament that's starting right now, or one that started recently and you can still get in with 80 big blinds. Well, you should obviously play the one that you have a much deeper stack at, assuming your time permits it, right? So you always want to consider what's referred to as opportunity cost. How much does it cost me? Well, what other things am I giving up in exchange for doing the thing that I'm going to do? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to play a $100 tournament to make $5 when you could play a different $100 tournament and make $20. Or perhaps you could go play cash games if you're a good cash game player and make 20 bucks an hour, right? Uh, when you are playing a re-entry tournament, a lot of players think that they should try to gamble to try to get a large stack at any point in that tournament before the end of the re-entry period, and that is just almost always not the case. Because whenever you gamble hard and get your money in with, let's say, 40% equity, well, you're giving up 10% of your buy-in, right? The, the difference between 40% and 50%. And if you win, yeah, you have two starting stacks, but if you lose, you have to buy in again. So you're putting in an entire additional buy an amount. It does not make sense. The only time it may make sense to gamble a little bit is right at the end of the re-entry period when you have something like 30% of a starting stack or less. And if you double up to 60% of a starting stack, you should still go back to playing normally. And, and that's presuming you think you still have some sort of an edge at the end of the re-entry period if you were to bust and re-enter. But you really should not be trying to gamble to try to get a big stack. We see players do this all the time in all sorts of re-entry tournaments. It's nuts. Sometimes they'll do it with more than a buy-in, and it's absolutely ridiculous, and they are torching their money.
do not torture your money. When you are playing against someone who does play insane to try to get a lot of chips, make sure you are way more call happy against them. Don't make big folds against them because they are trying to get all the chips quickly before the end of the re-entry period. And if they are going to punt away their money, make sure you are there to collect it. Now let's talk about satellites. And satellites, the ones we're talking about here, this is the most common type, one in 10 players wins a seat to a bigger tournament. That's what I want me to do here. You have to, you must, you must. Must is probably stronger verbiage. So let's say you're playing, let, let's consider a satellite here where it's a $1,000 buy-in. And for every 10 players who play, a $10,000 buy-in seat will be rewarded to one of those players. So if 100 players play, not accounting the rake, that means they're going to be able to give away 10 seats to the $10,000 buy-in tournament, right? 100 down to 10. In satellites, your return on investment is capped because the most you can win is 10 buy-ins. Whereas in a normal tournament, the most you can win is many buy-ins, right? In a thousand or in a hundred player tournament, you may, may be able to normally win 30 buy-ins or so. So your return on investment in satellites is capped, which is a bit of a problem. It cuts down on your win rates. Next, if you are lucky enough to win your way into the main event, now you have to play for 10 times the stakes. If you are only properly bankrolled for $1,000 buy-in tournaments, we already talked about it earlier, it would be really dumb to play a $10,000 buy-in tournament. It does not make sense. Also, if you play a lot of satellites and you're really good at satellites, well now, you have to play a game with a completely different structure. Because in a satellite, you're only trying to get in the money. There is no benefit in taking first place. First place is irrelevant. You're just trying to get in the top 10%. In a tournament though, that is not what you were trying to do at all. You were trying to take the top first, second, or third places. And this results in many players who are excellent at satellites not being quite so good at tournaments. Usually, they highly overestimate the value of getting in the money in a normal poker tournament. And certainly there is merit in getting in the money in a normal poker tournament, but not at the detriment of making it, well, not, not in such a way that it makes it close to impossible for you to win the tournament. It's not that hard to get in the money something like 25% of the time in regular tournaments. But you can do a little math. If you get in the money 25% of the time and you double your money, and then you never win because you sneak into the money every time, you're losing half of your money, right? And that's a disaster. And sure, sometimes you'll run ungodly hot and you'll spike, but you do not win at poker tournaments by blinding out and sneaking into the money. I cannot make this any more clear. If you look at a lot of the biggest winners in the world, they may only cash, let's say, 15% of the time when 15% of the field gets in the money. Some, some of them cash even less. If you look at a lot of the biggest winners online, they're only cashing 12% of the time. But when they get in the money and when they get near the bubble, they have a ton of chips and they use a ton of chips to push around their opponents and lock up lots and lots and lots of victories. You win at poker tournaments, not by cashing a ton, but by winning the tournament a ton. So anyway, if you're good at satellites and you get into the main event, now you have to play for 10 times the stakes with a different structure that you may not be completely fully studied at. And then finally, to make things even worse, if you cash a satellite, let's say one in eight times, you're good. You're supposed to cash one in 10, you're better than your opponents, so you're gonna cash one in eight and you cash the main event one in eight, which is about average, you will get some money back one in 64 times. That means you gotta play the satellite on average 64 times to get one cash. I mean, look at this here. Basically, your graph is gonna look like this all the time. You're gonna be down all the time with almost none of these spikes. It's more like this right here. <laughs> you're going to lose the vast majority of the time, assuming you only play satellites. Now, I realize everyone does not only play satellites. A lot of players play satellites because they want to gamble and try to get into the main event. But again, we're not degen gamblers here. We are trying to win money. And the way you win money is by focusing on one specific variant of poker, not two, and by playing within your bankroll. It is very egotistical for anyone to think that they can learn multiple games quickly and well, and it's very egotistical to think that you can play for 10 times the stakes that you are used to or bankrolled for. A blunder. 
there are perhaps a few times where it makes sense to play satellites if your casino is adding satellite or adding main event entries to the satellite so they're giving it um, an overlay it may make sense to play if you are properly bankrolled for let's say a $1,500 average buy-in and they have a satellite for $700 to win your way into a $3,500 tournament so instead of one in ten it's one in five it may make sense to play that $700 tournament if there's or that $700 satellite if there's nothing else going on because, you know, that lowers your average buy-in a little bit, which is nice. And there's nothing else to do, so you might as well make good use of your time. And then, win or lose, you plan on playing the $3,500 buy-in soft main event because that's within a 4 to 1 or so spread of your $1,500 average buy-in. So, sometimes it makes sense to play satellites, but I'm telling you, it is few and far between. A lot of people make blunders by playing a satellite to try to win their way into a tournament that is far bigger than they are bankrolled for and that they are not nearly skilled enough to have an edge in. A lot of players love satellites. I'm sure a lot of you are not going to like this. I'm not here to try to make you feel good. I'm here to tell you the truth so that you don't lose all of your money, okay? I'm here to help you. So that's it. Tournament bankroll requirement in a nice, nice little 36 minute long video. Understand, to win at poker, all you have to do is find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. If you do those three things, you will win at poker. Most people, though, don't like to play games they can beat. They want to push the boundaries. They want to play against better competition. They want to test themselves. It's not how you win money. Next, they don't want to play a lot. They want to play one tournament a week for fun, and they expect to win every time. Hate to break it to you. I just showed you that graph, right? <laughs> And next, a lot of players do not want to keep a proper bankroll. They like to play big. They like to try to get rich quick. And I hate to break it to you, but poker is an amazing way to get rich slowly, but it is a horrible way to get rich quick, even though there are plenty of examples at this point in 2023 of players who have gotten rich quick. You see them. They're success stories. They are celebrated. But understand, if enough players try to get rich, get rich quick, Inevitably, some of them are going to get rich quick. And a whole lot of them, the ones who do not run super duper hot, are going to end up broke or struggling to make ends meet. And I do not want that for you. So please, please, please keep a proper bankroll. Put in a lot of volume. And you're never going to go broke. I've been grinding it out for many years. When I first started, I started with $50. I eventually moved to sit-and-go tournaments, nine-player tournaments. And I had a tiny edge, 5% but I won money consistently every single month because I had a little bit of an edge, not even a big one. I played a lot, played about 3,000 to 5,000 games every single month. I grinded hard and I kept a proper bankroll. And my bankroll over time just went straight up to the point where I turned that $50 into $350,000 playing at the most $200 buy-in tournaments over the course of three years. And I realized three years is a long time. A lot of people don't want to do the grind, but the grind is what is required if you want to ensure success. And I want success for all of you. That's me for today. If you enjoyed this video, click the like and subscribe buttons below. If you have a super degen friend who gambles away all their money, show them this video. They probably won't watch it. It's far too long for them. But maybe you can help them out. Good luck. Have fun. Thanks for being here. And I'll talk to all of you next time.